uh, diving in. So whenever I talk about oral chemotherapy agents, I always like to start off with what our mechanism of action is uh, for, for the class and then um, trying to link that towards the indications. And that's kind of my jumping off point for how to think about these agents. Um, from there, uh, from a monitoring standpoint, we're going to be talking about our adverse effects for each class and agent, and then looking a bit at uh, key interactions, dosing, administration pearls that um, I want you to, or I, I'd be thinking about whenever we're looking at these agents. So we have a lot of ground to cover today. Like I said, this is the agents for the first half of the lecture, starting on the more chronic side with the CML, um, myelofibrosis, and GDHD with the JAK inhibitors. And then moving on more towards the, the more AML side with FLT3 inhibition, IDH inhibitors, and our retinoic acid derivative. So starting off with our BCR ABLE inhibitors, um, I, I always find a little history instructive for this, or I think it just helps with my memory. So Gleevec, the uh, cover of Time magazine in 2001, really ushered in the age of oral chemotherapy, and we thought that this was going to be uh, the future of all cancer care. It, it didn't end up being all of cancer care, but it really was quite the starting pistol for the agents we're talking about today. And so Gleevec works through BCR ABLE inhibition, which is a fusion protein uh, resulting from a 922 chromosomal, chromosomal translocation, otherwise known as the Philadelphia chromosome, which leads to uncontrolled cell growth. This is most commonly associated with chronic myeloid le leukemia or CML, um, where it's uh, really a defining aspect of the disease. However, it's also commonly seen in acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL. And then due to uh, the multi-kinase inhibition of these agents, they might pop up in some other malignancies as well. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty. There we go. Um, so then I, I love my tables to compare these agents because I think it's a little easier to call out the similarities and differences between them. Uh, I, I do think it's helpful to think about these in terms of the generation. So matinib is our first gen agent. Desatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib are our second gen. And then ponatinib is our third gen. Um, looking at our renal dose adjustments, like a lot of our traditional chemotherapy, um, the, the rule for most of these agents is going to be their hepatic metabolism via CYP3A4. And then sometimes it's just easiest to call out the exceptions. So here, imatinib does require renal dose adjustments. Um, which the most common way that's come up is I feel like we've had a couple renal transplant recipients who have actually been. Then from a, a dosing standpoint, uh, nilotinib, I think, deserves a call out as being the only twice daily dose. We'll talk in a couple slides about the importance of adherence for these agents. And so that is worth noting whenever you're thinking about some of the young CML patients who might be starting a chronic medication. Um, looking at our metabolism, like I said, our, our rule here is going to be their almost all hepatic metabolism, though whether or not they require an adjustment for liver dysfunction varies. Um, and then uh, all CYP3A4 substrates, imatinib and nilotinib are called out as our inhibitors, where you get kind of the two-way interaction, which once again, the most common way I've seen that come up is either patients on um. Uh, anti-epileptics or for patients on like tacrolimus post um, uh, renal transplant. Food interactions are, I think, are really worth a call out with these agents. Um, most you can see are with food, panatinib, it doesn't matter with respect to food. Um, but nilotinib, once again, gets a call out for being required to be on an empty stomach, which combined with it being And then also, I like to call out the uh, the acid interactions here, and so this is where grouping by class is helpful because all of, all of our second gen interaction or agents are going to have uh, required an acidic environment for absorption, and so that means that we should be minimizing or uh, preventing our PPIs and H2RAs where able. Um, there are specific package insert recommendations for each of these where sometimes you can use them with an H2RA, 
there is some data and other malignancies that even whenever you follow package insert recommendations for these agents that some patients still have a shorter time to progression. So I think less acid, acid suppression is always better, um, but it, it can be a very difficult cir circumstance. Uh, if you have a patient who is required to be on a PPI and we have some, uh, some tricks up our sleeve, we can use if that's the case. But for all these agents, I would definitely be thinking about um, acid suppression agents and any interactions we might have to deal with on that, that account because they can be uh, quite difficult to manage. Uh, moving on to our toxicities then, uh, class toxicities are going to be bone marrow suppression, neutropenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia, as well as rash. However, each agent also has its own tox uh, unique. So once again, another big table, we'll move left to right on this. The, the fluid effects of all these agents I find interesting because they all seem to have some sort of edema or fluid effect associated with them, but the way it presents can differ from. So imatinib, the way that shows up is periorbital edema. So my red flags for that are, you know, vision changes, even though the most common thing patients report is just some puffiness around the eyes. I also think of imatinib as being uh, probably our most GI toxic. That's why that's recommended to be uh, taken with food. And so we can get nausea and then I've had patients report constipation or diarrhea or both alternating. So some people do definitely struggle with that. Um, moving on to desatinib, our fluid effects with this one are more on the pleural or pericardial effusion side. And then the, the thrombocytopenia I really notice is be, being potent with desatinib. Um, I always remember there was a patient who we forgot to, or we missed the the three A four interaction with them being on posaconazole, and his platelets went from about one fifty down to twenty within a week, and so uh, he was getting scheduled for a bone marrow biopsy because we thought he was relapsing. But really, it's just that potent thrombocytopenia from the agent, and then watching out for those drug interactions. Um, nilotinib, I always uh, kind of bucket as the cardiotoxic one. So this has a pretty potent QTC interval prolongation with it. So it does require baseline EKG. You also have this warning for peripheral arterial occlusive disease. And then I also think of these metabolic effects. So it can have pancreatitis with uh, like elevated lipase amylase associated with it. And then like metabolic syndrome uh, from a lipid standpoint as well. Lucutinib's the, the newest second gen on the block. And I think we're, our clinic is still trying to It does have warnings for pleural effusions and pericardial effusions like the other, kind of similar to the satinib. Um, and we've had mixed success with patients who have had a few, uh, history of effusions uh, being able to be maintained on both sutinib. Um, and then it does have a significant warning for hepatic toxicity as well as diarrhea is another important thing to monitor for. Then ponatinib, our third gen agent, um, we think of as kind of our, our most toxic. This has a black box warning for death, which of course is always somewhat alarming whenever you're using an agent with that and a challenge whenever you're counseling a patient. And so the, the warnings for this or what comes up are the ischemic And then in addition, it also has some metabolic effects with pancreatitis and high blood pressure and hepatotoxicity. Ponatinib, I don't think I used in my first four years of practice, and then we've probably used it in 10 people in our past two years or so um, due to its growth in, the, in the, largely in the ALL population. So that's one that's becoming more relevant, and we're still trying to identify um, what is the likelihood of those toxicities whenever someone might only be on it for a limited course of therapy as opposed to lifelong? I think, or I always like to call out adherence in CML because we, the data for it's so impressive. And I think we always assume our um, cancer patients are adherent to their uh, oral oncolytics, but uh, I think it's great to have the data and the single target that CML provides to really show us how important that is. And so poor adherence to abatinib is identified as the most important factor contributing to cytogenetic relapse and failure. 
Um, there is data uh, out there that showed, not surprisingly, non-adherence associated with a poor response. Um, I always like that 85% cutoff that you see at the bottom of the slide. So 85% adherence is about four missed doses per month, which isn't isn't a ton. You know, one dose per week make, gives you a, a very significant difference in terms of your uh, likelihood of losing your your remission for the, for the medication. Um, lower adherence, so things to watch out for: screen for patients. Uh, younger patient age, which I don't think is surprising. These patients are pretty wide eyed whenever they're 30 years old and find out they have to take a leukemia medication the rest of their lives. I always like to uh, call out to adherence isn't always just a patient choice or a patient being irresponsible. A lot of times it can be because they're really struggling with the drug. And so I um, uh, adverse effect management, I think, really is a hallmark of uh, increasing patient adherence. And then high copays, since these medications are becoming more costly, though uh, imatinib, at least it now is uh, generic and is affordable through Mark Cuban Pharmacy. Hopefully, we'll see more of that down the line. And for imatinib intolerant or non-responsive patients, they still might have challenges with copays. Then um, last year, we had our stamp inhib inhibitor approved, which was exciting with the Siminib. And so the the niche or the new thing with this is that it binds the mirastoil pocket of BCR ABL. So it's an allosteric inhibitor as opposed to our other um, our other BCR ABL inhibitors were all competitive inhibition. Uh, so a bit of a new mechanism, which is exciting for this. Um, licensed in both chronic phase previously treated with two more TKIs, as well as people with uh, T315I mutation. So it does give us another option in addition to ponatinib for those patients. I do like to call out the um, six-figure price tag per month for that since the, the manufacturer doesn't offer any other tablet. And it's about uh, $40,000, I think, for the 80 milligrams. Um, does need to be administered on an empty stomach. And then uh, also 3A4 substrate weak inhibitors, so not too many drug concerns on that side. Um, I like to pull the, the trial for this one to look at our adverse effects. You can see it was compared with the Sutinib. Um, the reason we've mainly used this or that I've seen it is people who have had multiple intolerances to different BCR able inhibitors. And I, this both Sutinib comparison, I think it tells you that it's not that different. Um, I don't really see anything here that's a huge call out. And I've honestly had mixed success whenever we've had these multi intolerant patients who switch to the seminib. Um, where uh, so I have one patient who said it's the drug for me. She's gone back to work. It's completely changed her life. Um, the other three or four we've tried have had similar intolerances to the seminib and it hasn't worked quite as well. So probably something that's worth trying for multi intolerant patients, but. I wouldn't expect a super high success rate. And then I did pull also the higher dose uh, data as well. Uh, this was a single arm smaller trial. And I think not surprisingly, you just do see a, a increase in adverse effects with the higher dosing required for that mutation. So this brings us to our assessment. If you guys could please just uh, type the answer you think in the chat. QR is a 27-year-old male, started on nilotinib as first-line therapy for CML. He is noted to have a suboptimal response to therapy, which may contribute. Could it be A, concomitant carbamazepine use, B, lansoprazole use as needed for heartburn, C, occasionally missing evening doses, D, taking with food, or E, all of the above? Sorry, I'm not. I might just be uh, missing the responses in the chat. They might not be. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, now I see them filtering in. Uh, but E, all of the above. Uh, carbamazepine is your um, induction anti-epileptic. So whenever you do have patients on essentially anti any anti-seizure med except for Keppra, we need to be doing drug interaction screens on these patients, and those can be really challenging to manage. Um, Lanzoprazole is our PPI, so it's going to be contraindicated with all our second-gen agents. 
occasionally missing doses. I always think of that four doses per month number, but we should really be trying to target that and see what we can improve. And then nilotinib is our exception that's actually taken on an empty stomach twice a day. Um, so that brings us then to our JAK inhibitors with ruxolitinib, fedratinib, and uh, picritinib. Ruxolitinib is our first drug in the uh, uh, in the class. It's a broad spectrum, so JAKs one and two uh, the, of the JAK stat pathway, which leads to cytokine expression, uh, important in hematopoiesis and immune function. Also a CYP3A4 metabolite, and then uh, we do have some renal adjustments here for uh, creatinine clearance less than 60, so pretty high whenever you're considering a myelofibrosis population. Uh, multiple indications approved for it, including myelofibrosis, polycythemia vera, and then the reason I see it most often is for the steroid refractory chronic and acute graft versus host disease. Moving on to fedratinib and procritinib, which I'd say is our, our second gen agents. These are JAK2 selective, um, both indicated in myelofibrosis. The picritinib is, uh, the indication is just for platelets less than 50, because it's thought to be less thrombocytopenic. Um, this has led to insurance approval challenges where we, I really haven't seen it approved except in patients who are below that threshold. Um, both 3A4 metabolism. From a warning standpoint, I think the big call out is the Wernicke's encephalopathy for fedratinib, which delayed its approval a couple years. So we need to check and replete thiamine prior to uh, initiation. The, the major adverse cardiovascular event, I haven't um, necessarily encountered a lot in practice, but it is definitely in those uh, package inserts and is something to be alarmed about or to be cognizant of. And then uh, hemorrhage and QT prolongation for our picritinib. Um, I did like to pull the uh, adverse effects for this. So you can see highest incidence of anemia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, for the, the ruxolitinib. The thrombocytopenia, I, I would, I think that picritinib number is a bit of a trick because they only enrolled patients with platelets less than 50 on the trial. Um, so um, I, I suspect that actually has less thrombocytopenia than the other agents. Uh, but bone marrow toxicity is going to be one of your major dose limiting factors. And then we can see pretty high incidence of diarrhea and nausea with fedratinib and picritinib, as well as we've had some patients with significant weight gain on ruxolitinib. Brings us to our uh, AML agents with FLT3 inhibitors, metastore and gilteritinib, and the newly approved quizartinib. So FSM like tyrosine kinase 3 or FLT3 uh, is important in hematopoietic survival and proliferation. Comes in two different forms, ITD as well as TKD. And so our, uh, and then, so our type 1 inhibitors such as metastore and gilteritinib uh, inhibit both those forms, ITD and TKD. Type 2 inhibitors um, are uh, not effective against the uh, TKD subtype, which becomes uh, relevant with our quizartinib being approved in the past year. And then, like many other agents, we also have first gen that are more broad spectrum and we're likely used in other diseases first, uh, serafinib being a great example of that, versus our second gen that are more potent and selective for FLT3. And I'd, I'd put quizartinib in that second gen bucket. So our uh, comparison table then from an indication standpoint, mitostorin uh, and quizartinib are approved in frontline therapy. Uh, one difference there is the quizartinib also has the maintenance approval. Uh, so uh, in combination frontline with HIDAC and then in ma maintenance continuation versus mitostorin just has the approval with induction and HIDAC. Gilteritinib is approved in the relapse or refractory setting. And then mitostorin also has the mast cell leukemia and systemic mastocytosis approvals. Um, mitostorin and quizartinib, the, the durations are somewhat similar. It's that 14 days of therapy. Gilteritinib will be continuous dosing due to that single agent relapse indication. Uh, all hepatic 3A4 metabolism, which is going to be relevant whenever you consider that our ant mold active antifungals are strong 3A4 for inhibitors and have our mortality benefit in, in induction AML. So that is an interaction that we'll have to work around and deal with. And then from a side effects standpoint, uh, the nausea with mitostorin is quite potent. Patients tell you it will tell you it smells like a skunk. And so it does require uh, anti-emetic pre-meds. 
And then we can see some diarrhea and transaminitis with the other agents. Um, from an additional warning standpoint, I, the QT prolongation in the REMS program with Prozartinib is, uh, is really called out. There's a lot of requirements around that. Um, a lot of dose modifications recommended for interactions or if the patient uh, does have prolonged QT. So that's something that definitely requires um, some extra focus and oversight, um, especially as we move to implement that medication in the next couple months. Um, so that leads us then to our isocitrate dehydrogenase inhibitors, our uh, IDH inhibitors, enosidinib, ivacidinib, and the new kid on the block, oludacidinib. Um, and so the uh, IDH then, it's um, the mutant variety results in the inability for cells to differentiate. It does come in two different flavors, IDH1 and IDH2, which function in different parts of the cells. Um, even though from a, a therapy standpoint, there are differences between the agents, um, but it's not something that I call out that much. I, I, I tend to do more bucketing than splitting on these two. And so uh, looking at our table then, ivocidinib and oludocidinib are our IDH1 inhibitors versus enosidinib is an IDH2 inhibitor. Um, Ivocidinib is uh, indicated in newly diagnosed or relapsed refractory AML versus our other two are just in the relapsed or refractory setting. Um, from a dosing standpoint, oludocidinib gets called out for similar to nilotinib being a BID med on an empty stomach that could be a little challenging for a, a compliance challenge patient. Go with the standard uh, hepatic metabolism. And then from a side effect standpoint, we can see some nausea with these. Differentiation syndrome is your big warning that we'll dive a little more into on another slide. And then you can see uh, LFT abnormalities, elevated bilirubin, enosidinib, you can see at 81% is a pretty high incidence. And there's a lot of specific call outs for how to dose mod that if we have to. Um, class warnings are gonna be the QTC prolongation as well as differentiation syndrome. And so diving a little more into that differentiation syndrome then, this occurs to rapid proliferation and differentiation of those myeloid cells. So that gets back to our mechanism of action because the IDH uh, mutation pro, uh, prevents myeloid uh, maturation. Uh, then whenever you give these agents and the IDH inhibit, um, uh, enzyme begins functioning as it's intended, then you get this rapid differentiation of cells. So symptoms for that may include dyspnea, pulmonary infiltrates, uh, renal impairment, fever, as well as rapid weight gain. Um, the call out with these agents is, as opposed to the next agent we'll talk about, it has a long tail for our range. So we usually think about more on the month scale for onset for this. And then our standard treatment will be uh, dexamethasone and likely holding the agent. Brings us to our last myeloid agent for the day, which is the retinoic acid. Uh, derivative tretinoin, otherwise known as all trans retinoic acid or ATRA. And this is used in acute promyelocytic leukemia, uh, also as a differentiating agent. There is a significant pill burden with this, uh, where it's uh, you know, 22.5 milligrams per meter squared. You assume a two uh, meter squared BSA patient. Uh, you're looking at somewhere between five, 10 capsules, a, uh, or around 10 capsules a day or so. Uh, thankfully, they're small, but it's a, it's a lot of pills for someone to swallow. Um, and then recently, it has been on shortage. I believe that, or we haven't had issues with actually, uh, or we've always been able to obtain it for our patients. That is something we'll have to kind of keep an eye on as the, the shortages can come and go. And then uh, non-3A4 hepatic metabolism, which is nice because we don't have to worry about as many drug interactions with it. Uh, so from a side effect standpoint, the differentiation syndrome, the big call out here is that it can be within hours of the first dose. Um, so we do use prevention with prednisone in most patients for this, uh, that's slowly tapered as, um, uh, at, as essentially the, the patient's leukemia starts to improve. We can also treat with dexamethasone as in our IDH inhibitors. Um, so for our new APML patients starting on ATRA, that's going to be uh, one of our key monitoring signs. And then also significant metabolic abnormalities with this, where we can see uh, high cholesterol or triglycerides. 
um, up to 60% of patients. Many require pharmacologic therapies with triglyceride lowering agents. So these are people who you'll see triglycerides in the uh, over a thousand sometimes. Um, and then LFT abnormalities. And then the other call out here is whenever someone does have atra intolerances, it can just be very difficult to manage because it's uh, only in class agents. So there's not really many alternative options or other things that we can do um, to uh, to mi mitigate those or to uh, switch to. We really have to work on our uh, toxicity management for those. So that's the the quick and dirty uh, myeloid breakdown. I think I'll. Because uh, I know Maggie has a lot of data to get through or information to get through. I think I'll just stay on till the end and then we can do questions then. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Can you all see my screen okay? Yep. Looks good. Great, great. Um, so thanks for the intro, Cam. Um, I'm my name is Maggie again for those of you who I haven't met. Um, and without further ado, we're gonna jump into part two of this hematology oral chemotherapy presentation. Um, so, as far as drugs that I'm going to be reviewing today, we're going to start with the immunomodulatory agents or the IMIDs. We'll take a look at BTK inhibitors, our PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, our BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, and then our nuclear export inhibitor selenexor. Um, as far as objectives go, mine are the exact same as CAMS. Um, so, let's jump right into it with the immunomodulatory agents. We'll talk specifically about lenalidomide, pomalidomide, and thalidomide. So, another little mini history lesson for you all. Um, we can't talk about the image class without first touching base a little bit on the history of thalidomide um, hitting the market. Um, and this history really does play an important role in the education and monitoring that we do today for the REMS program for all IMIDs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, so, thalidomide was first marketed in Germany in the late 1950s, actually as a sleep aid, and it was shortly thereafter used for the treatment of morning sickness in pregnant women. Uh, within a few years of widespread use in Europe, Australia, and Japan, over 10,000 babies were born with a birth defect uh, called phocomelia, which is a condition of shortened, absent, or flipper-like limbs. Um, and it wasn't until 1961 that a, a physician actually associated thalidomide with these birth defects. Um, so, in, at that point, it was banned from many countries. Um, this situation was avoided in the US in large part because of the FDA inspector at the time, Frances Kelly. Um, she actually held up the approval of thalidomide in the US, mostly because she was concerned about the lack of studies that were done in, this, uh, in the pregnant population. And she was actually mostly worried about the side effect of peripheral neuropathy. Um, she then actually won like a, an award for holding her ground despite the pressure to approve this medication in the US without those background studies. Um, so this whole thalidomide tragedy led to the Kefauver Harris Amendment Act, which required drugs to be proven both safe and effective prior to marketing. Um, and then fast forward in time in 1998, thalidomide then re-entered the market and it was approved for the use of myeloma and leprosy treatment. Um, so our REMS program, a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy um, is a program that applies to all three IMID agents um, with the goals to really prevent the risk of embryo fetal harm and then to inform prescribers, patients and pharmacists on these serious risks. Um, you have to be specifically certified as a prescriber of these agents, and then pharmacies need to be certified as well. So only certain pharmacies can actually dispense these prescriptions. There are lots of steps um, that are involved in this REMS program for all 
kind of three parties that are, are majorly involved. So prescribers or a de designated uh, representative have to get an auth number for each prescription. You have to list that auth number and the patient risk category, i.e. are they a non-reproductive female, reproductive potential on every single prescription. Um, for females who are of reproductive potential, you have to actually verify a negative pregnancy test prior to all dispenses. Um, each prescription can only be written for up to a 28 day supply. And then a new prescription is required for every single dispense, i.e. you can't put refills on these. Um, for patients, they have to complete a confidential survey either online or via phone prior to filling the medication. And then again, females of reproductive potential have to use at least two effective methods of birth control. And then pharmacies have to get a confirmation number for each product prior to dispensing, and they have to go through an education checklist with the patient prior to every dispense. As far as how these drugs work, um, we know their mechanism of action is multimodal and we, we don't completely understand it, but we know that it has several different impact on, impacts on the cells that lead it to be effective in different types of um, hematologic malignancies. So there is some direct cytotoxicity and apoptosis on cancer cells. There's some inhibition of IL-6 release and decreased myeloma cell adhesion. There's decreased angiogenesis and then enhanced um, T cell cytokine production and natural killer cell mediated cytotoxicity. All right, so this slide here will go through like the indications, dosing, and how it's eliminated from the body. Um, structurally, all the images are very similar to one another, but as you're going to see on this slide, clinically, there are some really key differences in how we use them and then the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic effects. Um, so to start with thalidomide, this is approved for use in myeloma and leprosy. The dosing is 50 to 200 milligrams, typically dosed on a daily continuous schedule. Um, this medication is eliminated from the body via hydrolysis, so it's non-retal and non-hepatic clearance. Um, lenalidomide is probably the most widely used imid, um, so you'll see it in multiple myeloma, some B-cell malignancies, and MDS. Uh, most common dose is 5 to 25 milligrams, and it's most commonly given on a three weeks on, one week off schedule, although that sometimes depends on the combination that it's being used. Um, lenalidomide undergoes renal elimination, so you have to dose reduce it for um, patients with a reduced creatinine clearance, which is quite common in our um, multiple myeloma patients. And then palmolidomide as indicated in multiple myeloma and then Kaposi sarcoma as well. Uh, daily dosing is one to four milligrams. And then it follows that same typical schedule of three weeks on and one week off as lenalidomide. Um, this drug is hepatically cleared. So we have to be um, careful for drug interactions because it's, it's cleared through the SIP um, system. Uh, as far as adverse effects go of the class, there are several class effects that apply to all agents and then some agent specific class or agent specific effects that we should be mindful of. So, as far as the class side effects goes, we talked about embryo fetal toxicity that applies to all 3. Um, blood clots, so VTE, MI and stroke um, is a serious risk of all of these medications. Thromboprophylaxis is required in all patients. Um, we most commonly use a full strength aspirin once daily, but depending on patient history, um, sometimes that can vary. Um, they all have a possibility of rash and then infection as well. Um, when you look at the table on the right, you'll see that thalidomide um, is associated mostly with dose limiting neuropathies and then drowsiness too. No surprise there because its original place in the market was sleep aid. Um, and then myelosuppression is the dose limiting toxicity of lenalidomide and pomalidomide. So that's why you'll typically see it being dosed on that three weeks on, one week off dosing schedule, give the bone marrow break for a week. Um, you'll see that len lenalidomide here does have some potential for renal toxicity. Um, it's both renally cleared and potentially renally toxic. So just we have to use caution in those patients. Um, and then as far as secondary malignancy goes, uh, that's most mostly reported in our lenalidomide patients. Um, it's mostly AML and MDS, but some solid tumors are reported as well. 
And then um, incidence does depend on the setting, line of therapy that it's in, and you have to consider other agents that these patients may have seen, like if they've gone through a transplant and gotten MELF1. So next we will jump into our BTK inhibitors. Um, we'll discuss a brutinib, a calibrutinib, and zanibrutinib. So um, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK specifically, is a downstream signaling kinase, and we know it's upregulated in different types of B-cell malignancies. Um, so inhibition of BTK leads to inhibition of B-cell receptor signaling, cell death, and then inhibition of cell migration and proliferation. So um, we've got three different generations of BTK inhibitors now. Our first generation is ibrutinib. Um, this is a covalent reversible inhibitor of BTK. You'll see it has moderate selectivity for the protein, and then it has several off-target effects that lead to its typically higher rates of adverse drug effects, which we'll touch on in a few slides. Acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib are our second generation BTK inhibitors. They're both covalent irreversible um, inhibitors of BTK. And you'll see acalabrutinib has high selectivity, zanubrutinib moderate. And then the last agent, which is our third generation BTK, is pyridobrutinib. Um, this binds to the ATP pocket of BTK in a different manner than the other three. And that allows it to be effective in both wild type BTK proteins, which is when you see the first and second generation you, uh, BTK inhibitors used. And it's also effective in patients who have a BTK C481 mutation, um, which is our most common mo mutation that we know of to date in patients with CLL and who have seen one of our um, irreversible BTK inhibitors. Uh, so this slide here shows the FDA approved indications for these agents. You may see them used off label, but this is kind of just package insert type FDA labeling. Um, so ibrutinib is indicated in CLL, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and then as a second line agent in chronic graft versus host disease. Acalabrutinib has approval in CLL and mantle cell lymphoma in the second line setting. Zanubrutinib is approved in CLL and Waldenstrom's, and then second as a second line agent in mantle cell and marginal zone lymphomas. And then pyridobrutinib specifically. Um, is FDA approved in the third line setting of mantle cell lymphoma after patients have received a uh, um, covalent BTK inhibitor. Okay, the slide here has the different dosing and clearance considerations for our BTK inhibitors. Um, so you'll see ibrutinib and pyridobrutinib are our once daily medications. Um, Acalabrutinib is always dosed twice daily. Zanubrutinib can be dosed once or twice daily. We more typically dose it twice daily. Um, the only medication that needs to be adjusted for renal insufficiency is pyridobrutinib. Um, the only medication that does not need to be adjusted in some degree of hepatic impairment is pyridobrutinib. The other three do require it. Um, and then all of these medications are metabolized by that CYP3A4 system, um, which sets them up to be have drug interactions with, with a lot of medications. Um, so even drugs that are considered um, moderate CYP inhibitors, in addition to our strong CYP inhibitors, would require some degree of dose adjustments and a lot of indications for these agents. All right, um, so this slide shows some adverse effects of interest for BTK inhibitors. Um, a couple things I didn't list here that are known effects of BTK inhibitors are infection and myelosuppression. Um, the adverse effects here that are the rates that are listed are not from head to head trials. So just keep that in mind when interpreting and comparing between agents. Um, but in general, we consider ibrutinib to have the most side effects because of those off target effects. Um, while pyridobrutinib does appear to have the best tolerability, but again, this is still pretty early in studies and head-to-head -head trials are, are in process. Um, so looking at these, ibrutinib typically has the highest rates of AFib that we see and bleeding. And both of this is both of these events are um, thought to be due to its inhibition of those tech kinases. And then ibrutinib's higher rates of diarrhea and rash are thought to be due to some off-target inhibition of EGFR inhibitors. 
Um, and then kind of the call out here, I, a calibrutinib is typically considered to have the highest rates of headaches. Um, so we do have some head-to-head -head studies looking at our first generation ibrutinib versus the second generation BTKs now, which is nice for comparing adverse effects head-to-head. -head. Um, so this is just a, kind of a screenshot here of the Elevate RR study, which was a non-inferiority study comparing ibrutinib to a calibrutinib in relapsed refractory CLL. Um, so you'll see um, ibrutinib had a little bit higher rates of major bleeding a calibrutinib actually had higher rates of grade 3 AFib than ibrutinib, while ibrutinib had higher rates of overall AFib. Um, ibrutinib had more severe diarrhea and more hypertension. And then, as I had said before, headache is more common in a calibrutinib. Um, this next trial are, are just some screenshots from the um, Alpine study, which was a phase 3 trial that was published earlier this year. It compared zanubrutinib to ibrutinib in patients, again, in that relapsed refractory CLL setting. Um, zanubrutinib did demonstrate uh, PFS improvement over brutinib in this study. And then it did have fewer discontinue rates, discontinue rates of adverse drug effects than ibrutinib and had fewer overall cardiac toxicities that led to drug discontinuation or death um, than ibrutinib. Um, so I say all that to say, in general, zanubrutinib is considered to be better tolerated, but adverse effects obviously still occur. So a little bit higher major bleeding events in ibrutinib, um, more diarrhea in ibrutinib. Uh, hypertension was actually a little more present as far as the grade three events go in the zanubrutinib group. And then ibrutinib, again, had higher rates of just all cardiac toxicities. Um, the last thing to touch on with BTK inhibitors that's um, that's really important in um, our CLL patients is the phenomenon of redistribution lymphocytosis. Um, and what it is, is it's essentially a transient increase in a patient's absolute lymphocyte count. Um, and that's a result of some inhibition of chemokine receptors from the BTK inhibitor that results of trafficking of CLL cells from the lymph nodes into the peripheral blood. Um, so this is not a relapse or a progression of their CLL, and it's typically not associated with toxicities either. Um, we see it pretty immediately upon patients starting BTK inhibitors, uh, and it can outlast anywhere from days to weeks. Next, we will talk about our BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax. Um, so, venetoclax works by inhibiting BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein, um, which results in cell death. Its FDA-approved indications are for CLO, and it can be used in, alone or in conjunction with an anti-CD20 antibody. And then in our AML patients, um, specifically in the setting of adults who are unable to tolerate intensive chemotherapy, we use them in conjunction with azacitidine, decitabine, or low-dose cytarabine. Um, you may say it be used off-label in our patients with uh, relapsed refractory and multiple myeloma, specifically if they have a translocation 714 mutation. And then um, in our mantle cell lymphoma patients in the relapsed refractory setting with or without ibrutinib. So venetoclax dosing is really dependent on the indication. I've got the two, the CLL and the AML here on this slide. Um, and that's really because of the variable rates of TLS that we see with these agents. So um, CLL has the highest rates of TLS associated with it. So you see that the dose is ramped up very slowly over the course of five weeks. Um, whereas AML, it's typically a three and maybe four day ramp up. Um, if you're using it in combination with a hypomethylating agent, it's to, it's a three-day ramp up. Whereas if you're using it in combination with low-dose, say, terabine, it's a four-day ramp up because of that higher dose. Um, and then additionally, sometimes in AML patients, if we deem them to be lower TLS risk, um, we can just start at target dose. Um, these medications are taken daily with a meal and a full glass of water. And then I have a little asterisk in the AML uh, target doses. Um, venetoclax doses have to be dose adjusted for drug interactions. Um, and a common drug interaction that we see are our azole antifungals. 
Um, so in our AML patients, those are something that we are typically starting them on. So their target dose is oftentimes lower than what you may see um, listed on like a package insert um, because of that drug interaction. And our treatment plans actually do give some good guidance on target dosing uh, in these situations. As far as adverse effects go with venetoclax, big ones that I tend to think about are myelosuppression, GI toxicity, mostly diarrhea, and then, of course, TLS. Um, so you'll see that neutropenia rates are quite high for venetoclax. Um, febrile neutropenia um, is most commonly seen in our AML population, which isn't too surprising um, with, the, um, with their uh, low ANCs, typically a baseline. Um, thrombocytopenia is common. Uh, diarrhea is typically manageable, often present to some extent when it's, um, or can be present to some extent when used as monotherapies. In our AML patients who are getting common, concomitant hypomethylating agents, sometimes we can see constipation as well. And then you'll see TLS is quite a bit more common in our CLL patients with hyperuricemia rates being close to 40%. All right, so what do we do about our CLL patients and TLS prevention and monitoring? So I already mentioned that it requires a really slow ramp up. Um, all patients should receive allopurinol, ideally 72 hours prior to starting venetoclax. Um, some of our patients who are deemed high risk or who may have some hyperuricemia at baseline may require rasbiracase up front. Um, our patients have to hydrate really well, so at least 64 ounces of water, non-caffeinated beverages a day, plus or minus some IV fluids. And then we have to risk stratify our patients based on TLS risk and tumor burden um, and concomitant comorbidities um, to determine the appropriate site of monitoring for them. So um, for our low, low to medium risk patients, it's okay to monitor these patients in the outpatient setting with the understanding that they're going to have quite a bit of lab monitoring up front. Um, so we need to get labs at baseline. Six to eight hours post our um, 20 and 50 milligram dose initiations, and then 24 hours post dose. Um, and then for the remaining escalations, they just get pre-dose labs, assuming that all went okay. For our high-risk patients, um, and this is typically defined as patients who have any lymph node greater than 10 centimeters or any lymph node over five centimeters with an absolute, absolute lymphocyte count over 25,000. Um, these patients actually require hospital admission for their first two dose escalations. Uh, so we do very frequent lab monitoring for them. Um, we're getting baseline labs and we're drawing labs again at four, eight, 12 and 24 hours after those do initial doses. Um, and then if all goes well, um, they can get their lab monitoring completed outpatient with um, frequent lab monitoring upon subsequent dose escalations. So um, next we'll talk about our PA3K inhibitors, adelalisib, copanlisib, and duvalisib. So the PA3 pathway, pathway is important for cell growth, apoptosis, cell metabolism and survival, and several other functions in the body. Um, there are three main classes of PI3K families, each having at least one subclass with further isoforms. Um, so the main PI3, PI3K class of interest in terms of drug targeting is our class one family. Um, so PI3K inhibitors can be PAN inhibitors that inhibit all isoforms. They can be isoform specific or dual PI3K and mTOR inhibitors. Um, and then the toxicities that you see with each agent kind of depend on their isoform specificity. Um, so alpha and beta isoforms um, play an important role in insulin signaling. So something you'll see in alpha inhibitors are rash and hyperglycemia. Um, the delta isoforms um, preferentially are preferentially expressed on leukocytes, so you'll see some myelosuppression, um, and then can also get transaminitis and GI toxicities. And then our PAN um, inhibitors result in lots of side effects, including fatigue, diarrhea, rash, and hyperglycemia. 
Um, so this slide here shows the our currently FDA approved PI3K inhibitors and their formulations that are available. So adelalisib is indicated in the um, relapsed chronic lymphocytic leukemia space. Um, it's an oral formulation and it is dosed twice daily. Opanlisib is um, indicated in relapsed follicular lymphoma. It's our, actually an IV agent and it's dosed weekly. Duvalisib, again, is relapsed refractory CLL. It's an oral agent dosed twice daily. And then apolisib is actually indicated in the advanced breast cancer space, um, and that is a once daily oral medication. So I'm going to use idelalisib as kind of my um, PI3K inhibitor to dive into for adverse effects. Um, in general, it's a it's a tricky uh, medication to tolerate. There are a lot of adverse effects, and they can be really serious. Um, so you'll see fatal and serious hepatotoxicity can occur in up to 16% of patients. Grade three or higher diarrhea colitis in 20%. Um, so this is actually a colitis that oftentimes requires steroids for treatment. Uh, pneumonitis can be present in up to 4% of patients. Fatal or serious infections are quite common in almost half of the patients who will be on it. Um, so thinking infections like PJP pneumonia, all these patients on this medication have to be on PJP prophylaxis. Um, and then CMV reactivation, so CMV monitoring. Um, grade three to four neutropenia is quite common, and then serious cutaneous reactions. Uh, the last medication that we'll dive into here is Selenexor, which is our nuclear export inhibitor. So Selenexor inhibits um, a nuclear transport protein called XPO1. Um, XPO1 is a nuclear transport protein that's overexpressed in cancer cells. Um, it's responsible for transporting growth regulators and oncoprotein mRNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. Um, Selenexor inhibits XPO1, so it inhibits its ability to carry these proteins where it needs to go. Um, that results in accumulation of these proteins in the nucleus, uh, resulting in cell death and apoptosis. Uh, so Selenexor is currently FDA approved in two settings, um, the relapsed refractory DLBCL setting. Um, it is a monotherapy treatment in this setting and is dosed at 60 milligrams twice weekly. And then in the relapsed refractory multiple myeloma setting, um, the two FDA approved um, Dosing regimens and combinations are listed here, um, but there are several other combinations used um, in studies. And the dosing of Selenix or in, in multiple myeloma really depends on the um, the regimen that you're using it with, and then anticipated tolerability for the patient. Um, so again, lots of adverse effects with this agent. Um, in some of the trials that you see, over 60% of patients required medication interruption and subsequent dose adjustments due to toxicities. Um, so thrombocytopenia is a big dose-limiting side effect. Um, you'll see high rates of overall thrombocytopenia and then still quite high rates of even grade 3 to 4. Neutropenia is something that we look for. Um, nausea is a big um, set adverse effect to look for in this patient population. Um, so this is a medication that we do educate patients to schedule antiemetics with. Um, so we will often give these patients on Dancitron to schedule prior to each dose. And then for typically about two days around the clock um, around their doses each week. And then we'll often throw on like a low dose olanzapine or a second agent too for nausea, nausea prevention. Um, hyponatremia is common and needs to be monitored and then neurologic toxicity. Um, so that can present in ways of like dizziness, mental status changes, syncope, depressed levels of consciousness and amnesia. Um, so something we should be screening our patients for. All right, so ended on a couple of uh, kind of uh, high adverse effect nasty drugs there, but to kind of just wrap up all of the um, oral chemotherapy agents with some key takeaway points here. 
Um, so like Cam said, use drug classes and their mechanism of action to use a baseline for understanding their indications, their toxicities, and their dosing strategies. Um, but you also have to be thoughtful of individual drug differences. Um, be aware of interacting medications. Um, so some red flag medications that are common meds that cause drug interactions or maybe um, inhibit or interact with our SIP pathway include warfarin, anti-epileptics, um, HIV medications, our azole antifungals, and then antiarrhythmics. So of course, if you've got a patient who are on those medications and you're thinking about starting a new oral chemo agent, not sure, ask a pharmacist. Um, you're also going to want to double check to see if it's okay to use stomach acid suppression with oral chemos until you're really familiar with the agents. Um, for patients with baseline renal or hepatic dysfunction, always check the specific agents to see if there are any dose modifications that are required. required. Um, some of these newer agents have pretty good recommendations in their package insert that are based off of the studies that, um, that were done on them. But of course, looking at tertiary databases and then primary literature when we need to in severe cases. Um, and then even though these medications are taken at home, most of them still require really frequent drug monitoring. Um, so not necessarily selling your patients on, oh, we're gonna be seeing you less, especially early on in their courses of these oral chemo agents. So with that, we would be happy to take any questions.